Okay, good morning. Um, there was a question regarding quiz six and lab practicum two, and um, with the change in the schedule, we moved some things around. I'm gonna have to go double check. Um, I know we had had conversations, myself, Dr. Geiger, and the, all of the lab team, that we may actually give them on the same day back to back, make them short, but we're not entirely sure about that, so stay tuned for clarification on, on the schedule of the upcoming quizzes. All right, so <clears throat> let's um, recap where we had left off. We started to talk about stereochemical aspects relating to um, sugars, and we had started to talk about glucose, galactose, and fructose, which is, are the pretty much the three important uh, hexoses, which are six carbon sugars that we're going to be studying as we start to embark in the, in the carbohydrates discussion. So if you look at their skeleton without any perspective, you'll notice that on the left is this, the common skeleton of glucose and galactose. They both have four chirality centers. Technically, 2 to the 4 equals 16 possible stereoisomers. If you notice, there's no possibility of symmetry for this structure. So there's no possibility of any meso compounds. In the case of fructose, there are three chirality centers attached to that uh, compound. So two to, the, 2 to the 3 equals 8. There's eight different versions of the skeleton of fructose, only one of them, actually two of them, because they come in pairs of enantiomers, will be uh, fructose. Others will be named differently. So we believe left off at this slide when we were starting to introduce glucose and galactose. And again, because there's four chirality centers, there's uh, 16 different stereoisomers that exist as eight pairs of enantiomers. And I think the last thing we mentioned, the last two things we mentioned that was that if you focus on the aldehyde of the uh, sugar, let's focus on glucose, and you look at, at the way that the skeleton has been drawn at this furthest, furthermost chirality center from the aldehyde, which is on carbon number five. <clears throat> number one is always the aldehyde. And if you number now, that's carbon number five. That one is showing as coming out of the plane of view. This is what defines a D sugar. So if you notice that all the sugars that are on that top part, they all have that last chirality center pointing upward. That's what classifies them as a D sugar. All three others are gonna be different between the four sugars that you see there on the top. Now, if you flip every single chirality center, you're going to get the enantiomer. So if you focus on galactose here on the far right, the one that's underneath it is the alternative version of galactose. Notice every single chirality center has been inverted, right? So that's what makes it the enantiomer of glucose. And if you specifically focus on that last chirality center furthest from the aldehyde, this one, it has the opposite configuration as well because it's the enantiomer. If you compare all the sugars on the bottom tier, all of them have that last chirality center pointing downward away from you. That's what the dashed lines means. That's what define an L sugar. So we define sugars structurally these days based on the relative positions in three-dimensional space of all these hydroxy groups. And if you're looking at, again, this last one over here, you can either classify sugars all together in a larger group of either D or L, depending on where that last one is pointing. If it's pointing upward, regardless of every other chirality center, those are referred to as D sugars. The ones that have that last chirality center pointing away are referred to as L sugars. And then we're going to focus on it to our attention in this discussion and as we move forward uh, in the ones that are on the far right, which are the glucose and the galactose. And then it turns out, let me clean this up because this is already starting to get too messy. Uh, if you look at nature, nature has the power and the ability to choose uh, to make what it needs and it makes exactly what it needs and not necessarily anything more. It turns out that if you look in nature, the vast majority of sugars that exist naturally are D sugars. And if you look in nature at glucose and galactose, the overwhelming amount of glucose, 99 plus percent of what's out there and what 
our, our human body and all kinds of cells and organisms use to feed themselves, to provide fuel for themselves, they are de-sugars. Glucose is the most important nutrient for uh, all of the cells within our body. Galactose is another nutrient that comes from um, dairy products. Gl the combination of glucose and galactose together, as we're going to learn, is what makes up the sugar, it's a little bit larger, called lactose. And when we digest glucose and galactose, those of us who can, which is the majority of the population, ultimately that gets hydrolyzed, broken down into glucose and galactose. Turns out they're both D-glucose and D-galactose. Does it mean that these don't exist? It turns out many of these L-sugars, L-sugars, uh, are not naturally occurring. But because mankind has the ability or has acquired the ability to make things, then um, all of the possibilities of D versus L are well known, um, although they, not, they don't necessarily exist in nature. If we go to the next slide, we have the other eight. Remember, there were 16, right? Two to the four equals 16. The other eight are not really that important. Manos is one that's reasonably important. Um, we'll mention Manos every, every here, you know, here and there whenever it comes up. Um, but all of the other ones, uh, gulos, idos, talos, those are just random sugars that exist in nature. They don't have any uh, significance in terms of metabolism, energy providing, and, and whatnot. They're just uh, products of, of nature that, that just simply happen to exist. Again, primarily the D sugars. The L sugars are, are considered to be, for the most part, non-natural compounds, as I've been saying. So if you look at, uh, and notice again, just bringing you back to the to paying attention to detail. So just by looking at these skeletons, notice these are all D-sugars, right? You notice the, the furthest most chirality center is up for all of those. And the ones that are the L versions, they're going to be pointing down. And if you compare any two that are in the same box above and below, they differ in every single chirality center. And actually, let me go back one slide because I believe I mentioned this last time. And I want to point it out again because this is going to come up uh, at some point during our discussions. If you consider the difference between glucose and galactose, they only differ on the hydroxy group on group number four. So if you number one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, they only differ in one and only one. And if you remember the definitions, if they differ in at least one, but not all, they're called diastereomers. But it turns out there's another term that uh, carbohydrate biochemists have implemented into the whole discussion. And this is what we call epimers. So an epimer is a diastereomer that differs from its counterpart in one and only one chirality center. So glucose and galactose, yes, they're diastereomers, but they're specifically within the umbrella of diastereomers, they're also epimers <clears throat> because they differ in one carbon. And we call them C4 epimers because that's where they differ on carbon number four. Okay. All right. So back, whoop, back to... Um, fructose and uh, the other uh, types of related compounds. So again, there's the D version of fructose. In this case, we have to focus on the ketone, the hydroxy furthest from the ketone pointing upward. This is our D fructose. Here's our ketone. <clears throat> if you look at the hydroxy, that's furthest from the ketone. In this case, this is the down version. So this is the L version of the sugar. And this here, as we've said, is the D version of the sugar. There's only three chirality centers, so only eight possibilities. D fructose is the one that occurs naturally. L fructose is a man-made product. Now, as I said, it doesn't mean that there are zero, none, um, L sugars in nature. In fact, we will see examples. As I've said, nature makes what it needs for what it needed, needs it for, when it needs it. And there are some occasions in very specific places for very specific reasons that certain sugars have an L configuration as opposed to a D configuration. And we will see examples of those sugars when they become relevant. All right. So, <clears throat> There's an alternative way that was actually pioneered by carbohydrate biochemists 
to look at these structures that have multiple chirality centers. So we're going to introduce the concept because it turns out we're going to be using it again and again as we continue with the carbohydrates discussion. And we'll also come back when we talk about amino acids, and uh, which are the building blocks of proteins and other uh, important biochemicals. So if you consider a tetrahedral carbon with four different things on it, i.e. called a chirality center, and you imagine that you're standing in such a way, you're over here looking that way, and imagine your hands grabbing it by three and four and turning it such that, that you're looking at it head on. And if you're now technically looking at it as you see it on your screen, this is what you would be seeing if you're grabbing it with your hands on three and four, you would see three and four coming towards you right here, right? Imagine your hands holding to three and four, left and right. And then pointing away from you would be one and two, okay? So just imagine that you can then smack your screen and push it all down and smack it onto the, the white background, which is imagining it's a piece of paper. You're just swatting it like a fly and pushing everything back. So if you flatten everything, what then turns out to happen is that three and four end up on the horizontal position, and then one and two end up on the vertical position. But notice that by flattening it, and again, this is quote unquote flattening it, we've eliminated the wedges and the dashed lines. We now simply have solid lines because the whole thing has sort of been flattened onto the, onto the white background. So what we need to now understand is that this representation that's on the far right has a very unique and particular meaning. And this is what is known as a Fisher projection. So in a Fisher projection, when you draw a cross like this, at the junction of that perfectly square cross, these angles are 90 degrees depicted over here. At the junction of that cross, if there are four things attached to that point in the center to the cross, then we're talking about a chirality center. And by definition, by definition, the horizontal lines mean, even though they're not drawn with wedges, it means that whatever's on that horizontal line is pointing upwards towards your eyes. Whatever's on the vertical line, by definition, it means that it's going behind you. No, behind the plane of the paper before it's been flattened, okay? So you can very easily depict and represent enantiomers, and as we'll see, diastereomers that have multiple chirality centers using these Fisher projections. It actually makes it easier to visualize than using these wedges and dashes type of structures. So by understanding that the structures that are drawn on the far left and the far right are identical to the ones that are right next to them that are then separated by a mirror, you can clearly see if you ignore the ones far right and far left and focus on the Fisher projections that are in the center over here, notice that if you imagine a mirror in the middle, the one on the left is indeed the mirror image of the one on the right, okay? And the, these simply represent now enantiomers, the same enantiomers that are shown here and here, or here and here, they're now represented in the center by Fisher projections. And it makes it actually a little bit cleaner, a little bit finer to look at them and realize, oh, these two are mirror images. There's four things attached to these chirality centers. These two structures represent enantiomers, okay? So what turns out, that these structures become much more informative and much uh, more useful when you're actually dealing with multiple chirality centers as what happens with sugars. So as we're gonna see uh, in, in the discussion and particularly when we move into the actual chapter 10, pretty much all sugars or most sugars we're gonna be representing are gonna be drawn using these Fisher projections because they're very useful to represent when you have one, two, three, four, five, six, however many chirality centers these sugars ultimately end up having. So it's also very quick and easy to observe the existence of planes of symmetry in, in these structures or very easy to establish that there's absence of symmetry. So if you look at the first two structures, and again, 
noticing that R1 and R2 are different structures, right? So just, just to emphasize, let's make this something red, right? R1, and let's make R2 something blue so that you can clearly observe that there's no symmetry to those, to those uh, structures, right? So you, there's no line that you can draw down the middle of that first pair that makes it symmetric. And therefore, you can clearly see that these two are enantiomers, right? Now, if I continue replacing R1 with red and R2 with blue, then you can also observe that if I take the one on the far left, one of the pair of enantiomers that are shown there, and I simply invert one of them, but not both. So I've inverted, let me get a different color. I've inverted the one on the bottom over here. If you compare these two, right? So notice the top chirality center is the same. The bromine is pointing to the right. I'm not working with the diastereomers that are on the far right, the two compounds. If you look at the second chirality center, that one has been inverted. So those two structures, because they differ in one of the two, but not both, are diastereomers. And you can just very quickly, very easily observe by simply noticing the differences between the positions of the bromines and the hydrogens, that two, those two structures, they're not mirror images, they're not superimposable, they are stereoisomers because the connectivity is the same, they have to be diastereomers. The one on the far left, they are mirror images, because if you imagine a little mirror here in the middle, right, that mirror, one, the one on the right is the mirror image to the one on the left. Now, if the R1 and R2 groups happen to be the same, right? So now let's let's draw both of them in orange, right? Pick any color you want, but let's say now these two are the same. So what do you notice? Now you can observe, whoop, now you can observe that this now has a plane of symmetry going down the middle. So they're no longer enantiomers. If these two groups are the same, the structures are no longer enantiomers. At that point, they're going to be identical, right? Why? Because we're dealing with a meso compound. It's two chirality centers. However, there is a plane of symmetry. If you take this one and rotate it, left uh, sort of a, a 180 rotation over there, right? Then you'll notice that the one on the left and the one on the right will be able to superimpose on each other. So that then would result in a meso compound. So it's very easy to observe that when you're looking at Fisher projections. It's a little bit more complicated to observe that when you're looking at other structures based on wedges and dashes and you know typical line angle structures. So Fisher projections are very useful when you're looking at structures that have multiple chirality centers to then assess how are they related. Is this the enantiomer? Is this a diastereomer? Is this an epimer? All kinds of relationships can be established very easily. And then in many cases, if there's symmetry, it's not difficult to identify that symmetry reasonably quickly. Okay. So the, the D versus L classification of sugars is currently based on structure. And again, when you're looking at a sugar, which by definition, as we're going to define more uh, explicitly in the next discussion when we actually embark in chapter 10, sugars are classified as compounds having their aldehyde or ketone plus several alcohols as part of their overall skeleton. So here's the simplest or one of the simplest sugars that are out there, which is glyceraldehyde. And if you notice, here's the aldehyde, the CHO, the CHO, let me change colors. The CHO is the aldehyde, it's just been condensed. So if you realize, CHO means this, it's a, right? It's just been condensed. So if you notice the furthest most chirality center, well, in this case, it's the carbon that's right next to it, um, <clears throat> is the one shown here in the middle. And notice how it's now drawn as a Fischer projection, right? So if you observe, the atom in the center right here, it has the aldehyde, it has the hydrogen, it has the hydroxy, and it has the CH2OH. That is a chirality center. And it's the one that's furthest from the aldehyde. Well, it turns out it's just next to it in this case, right? If you draw the mirror right here, you can see there's a enantiomer, a mirror image. As we've said previously, 
If a structure has one and only one chirality center, it can only exist as a pair of enantiomers. So the one on the left is one version. The one on the right is the mirror image. Again, one group, two groups, three groups, four groups. And here's a Fisher projection. Remember what this means is that this is going up like this, hydroxy, H, and then these are going down, CH2OH, and then going down, CHO. And the opposite happens on the other side. This is hydroxy pointing up, hydro, uh, hydrogen pointing up, the aldehyde pointing down, and the primary alcohol pointing down. If you compare this one with this one, you can see that they're mirror images. Notice how convoluted all these lines and dashes and wedges and all this stuff. This is much cleaner to look at. You can still see the relationship. They're both mirror images, right? So glyceraldehyde is the basis for the definition of D versus L. And even though we already saw D versus L in the wedges and dashes structures that we saw earlier, the skeletal structures as we call them, uh, it turns out that as far as carbohydrate biochemists are concerned, the definition for them of what a D versus L sugar is, is actually based on the Fisher projections. So if you pay attention to the position of the hydroxy group on that chirality center that is furthest from the aldehyde or ketone, if it's something like fructose, if that chirality center on that furthest distance from the aldehyde is to the right, to the right on the Fisher projection, that's what defines a D sugar. D, the, the designator D refers to dextro. Dextro means to the right, okay? And then if that, on that same structure, that furthest most hydroxy group on that chirality center is pointing to the left, that's the L sugar. L comes from levo. Levo is the Latin for left. Okay, so dextro, Latin for right, that's the D. Levo, Latin for L, uh, for left, that's the L. That's where D versus L comes from. You may have heard of the term dextrose. Okay, dextrose is another name for D glucose. Okay, and it's related to the to the D. Structurally, we're going to talk about another concept that actually is where the D versus L actually comes from. But it turns out that structurally speaking, this is how sugars are now defined as D versus L using Fisher projections. Okay, so if you take glucose, here's glucose. This is D glucose. Whoop, something happened there. If you look at D-glucose, this is that D-glucose that we saw earlier in the normal skeletal structure or fully extended. It turns out that those structures as we draw them are actually, if you remember the term staggered versus eclipsed, when we talk about uh, uh, conformational arrangements of atoms and structures where bonds can rotate, turns out that that extended skeletal structure is what we call a fully staggered structure. If you start rotating all the bonds, which is what this is trying to represent over here, and you fully eclipse the structure, meaning that if you're looking down any two bonds, the atoms that are forming those bonds are the closest they can possibly be one to each other and they're eclipsing each other. So that would require rotating all those bonds and placing those atoms in that particular orientation. This is what actually turns out to uh, result from glucose. And then if you focus your attention on the center of the skeleton and you simply imagine that you're taking this and you're pulling it, peeling it backward and stretching it out, and straighten the whole skeleton, this is what you end up with when you're looking at glucose. So we, we walk you through all of this because what we want to point out is that here's the aldehyde. This is the chirality center that's furthest from the aldehyde. It's on carbon number five. So the aldehyde is number one, two, three, four, five. And if you notice, by making those motions, this pointing vertically upward on the fully staggered extended skeletal structure 
translates to a hydroxy on the furthest most aldehyde that is on the right side. Therefore, that's what makes it a D sugar. We've already established this is D based on what we talked about previously. My pen is acting up here a little bit. I'm, my apologies for these lines that appear out of nowhere. Um, the D sugar as defined by this, it turns out that it ends up with this on that position. So if we convert it to a Fisher projection, let me clean this up and I'll make more marks as needed. If we translate this into a Fisher projection, so notice everything that's coming out is horizontal. Turns out that the backbone, I, I, I know that I said previously that anything in the vertical is going backward. It turns out that technically when you're dealing with larger sugars like this one, larger structures, everything that's on the backbone and, and the vertical it refers to the backbone or the mainframe of the structure. It's actually on the plane of view, right? After it's been straightened out. So we're not showing them as dashed lines. The ones that are truly coming out of the plane of the view of, of, of the white uh, board are the hydroxies and the hydrogens. And if that's translated into a Fisher projection, it's on the far right. And then if you notice again, here's the aldehyde. Here's the furthest most chirality center. It's pointing to the right. This is what defines a D sugar. If it was in the opposite direction, then that would define an L sugar. Okay. So let me see if my slide is coming up. Okay, so here it is. So the one that we just drew in that previous slide. Let me make sure that I didn't advance twice because I did touch it twice. All right, there we go. Um, the one that we just draw on that previous slide was D-glucose. Again, here's my aldehyde. Here's my, my furthest chirality center. Notice it's to the right. That's D-glucose. If you imagine a mirror, the exact mirror image in which everything is in the opposite direction would define L-glucose. So notice this is to the right. Here it's to the left. Here, this is to the left. Here, it's to the right. This one's to the right. Here, it's to the left. Here is to the right, which is what defines the D version of the glucose. Here, it's to the left, which is what defines L glucose. If we make D glucose our reference point, because everything here has been inverted, this has to be the mirror image, which is L-glucose. What makes it L-glucose? Not only that everything is inverted, but what makes it L, this chirality center furthest from the aldehyde, is to the left on the Fisher projection of the structure, okay? If we focus on the far right, or on, on the pair on the right, meaning galactose, and this is why this is highlighted here in blue, it's because, remember, they, they differ in carbon number four. So let's do a little comparison over here, right? If you compare this with this, it's the same. This with this is the same. However, this one is different on carbon four. If you look at the next carbon, which is number five, this is still the same, right? So this is a D sugar. This is a D sugar but it's different from glucose on carbon number four. So this is D-galactose. They are C4 epimers. They're diastereomers as well, but they're C4 epimers. We've already defined this, so I've jumped ahead. Um, so that's D-galactose. They di It differs from glucose only on carbon number four. Okay, so if you then try to build the structure of L-galactose, well, it's the mirror image of D-galactose. So again, observe, this is different, and this one's inverted, and this one's also inverted, and this one's also inverted. All of them are backwards, right? So this is why if this is D-galactose, this is L-galactose. Why is this D? Because this is to the right. Why is this L? Because this is to the left. Okay, and why are they galactose? Because they differ from glucose on carbon number four, D with D, L with L. If you compare L glucose with D galactose, they're also diastereomers, but they are not epimers because they differ in more than one, therefore they're not epimers, but not all of them, right? If you, if you wanna figure out how many they differ in, all you need to do is compare the structure. So they differ in this one, they differ in this one, 
they do not differ in this one and they also differ in that one this is l this is d right they differ in three out of the four some but not all at least one but not all so l glucose and d galactose are diastereomers that's all you can say they're not epimers d glucose and d galactose are epimers l glucose and l galactose are epimers they only differ on position number four okay just like d galactose and d glucose do all right so fructose exhibits the same type of behavior there's only less of the possibilities of stereoisomers so here's on the left d fructose now drawn as a fissure projection so again if you pay attention here's the ketone the ketone is now our reference point the furthest chirality center is the one that's highlighted in the red box because the hydroxy is pointing to the right this is what we call a d sugar and therefore this is d fructose the mirror image in which everything has been inverted is what then we call l fructose so again notice this is the opposite this is the opposite this is also the opposite this is the one that defines the l version of the sugar and everything has been inverted any other possibility of a change in which only one but uh, at least one but not all you can call them diastereomers if it's one and only one then you can call them epimers in this case we're talking about the two enantiomers of fructose okay all right so what we need to introduce and this is going to come back in the next chapter with reasonable detail again so this is going to be the introduction we're going to review it once we start talking about chapter 10. you probably have seen at some point in discussions that we've had or in other classes that you may have taken that sugars tend to exist in ring forms in cyclic forms and every sugar that we've talked about or that we, we that we will talk about um, will or can in one way or another particularly when they are in aqueous solution which is every bodily fluid that's in your body will exist primarily in these ring forms so what happens is that let me go back these skeletons fructose participates in that as well but let me go back to glucose and galactose what happens is that the chirality center that is on that furthest most the excuse me the hydroxy the alcohol that's on that furthest most chirality center of the sugar the one that de defines it as either being d or l actually can wrap around and form a bond with the aldehyde and that's what ultimately closes the ring structure so it loops on itself and forms a bond with itself it's like your left hand looping around and attaching to the right hand and they they close the loop okay or your right hand suddenly grabbing your left foot and you're and you're wrapping your fist around your your toes and at that point from your arm through your abdomen down your leg all the way down to your foot and then back around you there's the loop right it has closed on itself it's formed a ring structure so this is what happens with these types of structures right in in the case of fructose what turns out to happen similarly is that this hydroxy ends up forming a bond with the ketone and then there's the loop right there it forms a ring structure we're going to look at these structures in more detail in the, in the next chapter so what this is trying to illustrate is just illustrating this process so here's the hydroxy that's coming from one end of the structure here's the aldehyde in the case of glucose or galactose that's on the other end of the structure so th these little squiggly lines simply means that there's some hanging hydroxide coming off of one side and there's some hanging right here's the point of attachment there's some hanging aldehyde and these two will find each other right and as they find each other then when what ends up happening is that the oxygen of what was the hydroxy forms a bond to the carbon of the carbonyl of what was the aldehyde shown here as the red dot and then this oxygen ends up picking up a hydrogen this hydrogen on the oh of the alcohol and the double bond breaks and ultimately you form this structure 
which generally speaking is known as a hemiacetal. So a hemiacetal is any structure that contains a carbon, let me, let me choose red so that we don't skewer that red, any carbon that is simultaneously bonded to two oxygens. One of those oxygens is an alcohol, the other one is an ether. All right, so simultaneously bonded to an alcohol and an ether. Anytime you see that, regardless of what this whole part is, it doesn't matter, this little arrangement over here, this little attachment, right? So imagine this is your hand, this is your foot, right? The oxygen comes along, latches onto your foot, right? And bonds are formed, things are exchanged, the hydrogen on the OH ends up on the what was the oxygen of the carbonyl, the pi, the, the double bond breaks, picks that up, and then ultimately they are latched onto one another, right? That attachment is if the carbon in the middle is bonded on one side to an OH, on the other side, on the other side to an oxygen that's then bonded to another carbon, that's what makes it an ether, that little structural piece is known as a hemiacetal, okay? It's, it's just a name, it's a functional group, it turns out, right? And that's the manner in which a sugar will bond with itself to form these ring structures and close on themselves. So here's a little um, cartoon trying to illustrate this process. So here's the Fischer projection of glucose. And here we've deliberately indicated, it turns out that in the, even in a Fisher projection, these two are actually technically pointing behind you as they should in a Fisher projection. The ones at the very ends, let me clarify, right? I mentioned earlier that if you have a long structure, the ones, in the, the skeleton is flat. Well, it turns out the ones at the very end are actually pointing behind you. So just imagine that you take this and you turn it sideways, right? And that's what this results. And now imagine that you grab it by the aldehyde on the right and the CH2OH primary alcohol on the left, and then you bend it. You know, take, imagine a little piece of wire that's extended and you take those two pieces at the end and you bend it, one towards the other, to bring them close to one another. So what that does is that it brings the CH2OH into reasonably close proximity to that aldehyde. So these two are going to be close to one another. Now we have to pay attention to this hydroxy here because this is the one that's going to ultimately form the hemiacetal bond to close the loop. So it turns out in that initial arrangement, the hydroxy down here is too far from this aldehyde to form the bond. So an additional rotation needs to happen to move the CH2OH upward and then bring the necessary OH closer to the aldehyde. So this is what this has done. So now notice, this is now in the perfect arrangement in which the OH can come along and form a bond and close that structure. And if you notice, because of the very particular positions of these hydroxy groups in all of the current centers of glucose throughout the skeleton, when you turn this sideways, that produced this one went downward, that's this one. This one went upward, which is this one. This one went downward, which is that one. And then of course, the last one is the one we have to focus our attention on, which is the one that's on that lower most chirality center, that's this one. But then what I want you to notice is that down up, down means down, up, down. Let me clean this up because it's getting too messy to look at it, right? Down, up, down was right, left, right. When you turn this sideways, so that still is down, up, down. The rotation to bring this in proximity to this happens beyond this one. It's in this bond that needs to rotate, okay? So we still have down, up, down, okay? Now notice this carbon with the red dot, 
that's the one that defines the sugar as D or L, right? This is to the right in the Fisher projection, so this is a D sugar. Well, in this rearranged structure in which this is about to latch onto this, notice that this CH2OH is now pointing upward in that skeleton that's about to close to form a ring. So we're going to see the significance of that. That's what's going to allow us to establish whether the sugar is a D sugar or an L sugar when we're looking at it in these ring structures. Okay. So the next slide illustrates how these ring structures can ultimately close. So here's the formation of the hemiacetal. The hydroxy attacks the carbon, the double bond breaks, picks up the hydrogen, and that establishes the, here's the hemiacetal down here, right? This, this is going downward, okay? There's the hemiacetal right there. So again, down, up, down, and then the CH2OH pointing upward is what defines this as a D sugar. The down, up, down in that particular order, starting from the hemiacetal, that's what defines glucose. So it's right, left, right in the Fisher projection. It's down, up, down in the, um, we call this a Hayworth projection. We've already talked about Hayworth projections, right? So what I want you to observe, if you thought you were done training your eye to pay attention to detail, these carbohydrate structures are the utmost example of training your eye to pay attention to minute differences between structures, okay? Again, I keep saying these things are gonna ultimately become important for those of you who are going to be taking care of, care of patient, direct care of patients, you're going to be seeing all sorts of different things. And it's the one that catches that minute difference of something who's going to save the life of that patient in some occasions. You're going to see this and mind my words, you're going to remember me the day that when that happens to you. Okay. All right. So if you notice, pay attention to the aldehyde. Okay. We are looking at it in a particular orientation in which the carbonyl is pointing sort of downward to the right, the hydrogen is sort of pointing upward. Remember, this is a trigonal planar structure. So now imagine that this bond rotates. So imagine if you extend the palm of your hand and you rotate it back and forth, back and forth. It's like a rotation, right? So the, the aldehyde can rotate in the opposite direction. And what that produces is now the oxygen is pointing upward and the hydrogen is pointing to the side. So notice these differences, right? There's two, they're very subtle, but they're differences. So if you stand back, and I'm gonna clear this so that you can see it. If you stand back and look, when this hydroxy comes along and forms this bond, because this oxygen is pointing slightly downward, what's that, what that is going to result is that in the ring form here, it's pointing down and it's gonna end up trans to this CH2OH, okay? In the alternative structure where there's been a rotation, when this hydroxy comes along and forms the bond, shown over here on the far right, what's gonna end up happening is that this oxygen is pointing upward. So that results in this oxygen here pointing upward, and it's gonna be cis to this CH2OH. Turns out both of those can happen, okay? It turns out that the cis version is more stable because if you notice, everything, if you draw it as a chair structure, everything is equatorial. In the trans version, this one happens to be axial, okay? So we call this one the alpha version of the ring structure. We call this one the beta version of the ring structure. We're going to define this in more detail in the next chapter. But this is yet another pair of diastereomers of the same compound, which is D-glucose. In its ring form, it can exist in either alpha or beta forms. The rest of the skeleton is exactly the same, 
Let me see if this thing has a highlighter. I think it's just a pencil. Yeah, it's just a pencil. Oops. Um, if you notice, the rest of the skeleton, I'm going to highlight this piece. It's going to turn into a big mess. If you highlight this piece and this piece of the skeleton, the up, uh, the down, up, down, down, up, down, that part is exactly the same, as is the CH2OH, because that's what defines it as a D sugar. But it's this one versus that one that is different. And this only happens in the ring structure. In the open chain structure, there's no such concept because it has to do in the way in which the hydroxy closes the ring and how this aldehyde is oriented relative to that. So we're going to see this in the next chapter in more detail, but I just want you to starting start to observe these structural differences between sugars, okay? All right, so this last section simply introduces some additional concepts related to manipulation of compounds, isolation, characterization, studying them, learning about their properties. And it turns out that diester, when you compare chemical and physical properties between stereoisomers, the ones that differ the most are diesterimers because they have the greatest structural differences between them. So if you compare galactose, glucose, and mannose, for example, they're all D-sugars. How do I know they're all D-sugars? Because if I'm looking at this one, right, notice, this is pointing upward. These are all D-sugars. I know this is glucose. In this arrangement, glucose is down, 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 right? And notice how galactose is down, down, up. It differs in one position, and that happens to be carbon-4. That's where they're different. Mannose is a completely different thing, right? Mannose actually differs in carbon number 2 relative to glucose. The other two are the same, okay? So if you observe the properties that are displayed here, uh, their melting points are different. Their solubility in water is reasonably different. Their density, it turns out just by chance that the density of, glu the density of uh, glucose and the density of mannose happens to be the same. The density of galactose is different. And then we need to talk about this little piece over here. There's actually one physical property in which stereoisomers are different. And that is what is known as optical rotation. And actually, let me, let me expand upon that. Um, when you compare enantiomers with each other, Everything will be exactly the same except this one property, which is called optical rotation. And of course, because diastereomers are different compounds, they will also have different optical rotation. So I just misspoke there for a minute. It's enantiomers that specifically differ in that one property, which is optical rotation. We're going to define what that means in a moment. It has very important applications in characterizing compounds. It also has important applications in uh, isolation of stereoisomers from one another, which for reasons we're going to discuss briefly, is a very important concept that may need to be done in the pharmaceutical industry when you're dealing with new medications, drugs, compounds that are going to be given to the masses uh, of people. Sometimes, as we're going to see, enantiomers, as subtle the differences as they are, they can have profound differences in their biological properties, and that can lead to severe and detrimental effects, as we're going to discuss. So what is optical rotation? So before we talk about optical rotation, we need to define what is known as plane polarized light. So it turns out that if you turn on a lamp or you know go to any light source, including the sun and anything coming from the stars from outer space, Light, as we described in the first half of the course, is a collection of an infinite number rotating in all directions in three-dimensional space of mutually perpendicular electrical and magnetic fields, and that's what we call it electromagnetic radiation. So it turns out there's an infinite number of electrical and magnetic fields oriented along the full 360 rotation of three-dimensional space. So this is what this is trying to illustrate. Here's the lamp, 
And these, these little waves over here are trying to illustrate all of the electrical fields that are going in all directions in three-dimensional space, okay? And this is how the light is coming out from any light source. I'm right now sitting in front of my window looking out a beautiful sunny day uh, as opposed to the last couple of days. So that's all that sunlight that's coming is all these waves are rotating in all directions because that's the way natural light is. Now, it turns out the folks at Polaroid in the 1920s, Polaroid unfortunately is no longer with us. If you drive, if you drive down Mem Drive from MIT to in direction of Harvard, there's a big white building. I think it's still there. I'm sure it is. It's once one of those jewels of buildings. Um, Polaroid was there starting from the 19, early 1920s up to, I don't know, a decade or so ago when they finally disappeared because of alternative technologies. Um, similar things happening with Kodak. Kodak is almost gone, at least in the photography department anyway. Anyway, I, I digress. So Polaroid perfected a contraption for lack of a better word, that had been already rudimentarily invented previously. In fact, the days of Louis Pasteur and other people in the late 1800s had already started to study these kinds of materials. But they perfected what is known as a polarizing filter. And the polarizing filter is composed of a material that contains these tiny little slits. And what makes the body of those slits is these substances that are magnetically and electrically active that they interact with electrical fields and as the light passes through it only the mag the electrical fields that are moving and oscillating perfectly parallel to the slits of the polarizer are going to get through so this is what this is trying to illustrate. Notice how everything before the filter is kind of going all over the place. Once the light hits the filter, only the ones that are perfectly parallel, notice these vertical lines, right? Perfectly parallel to the filter, only that goes through. Everything else gets absorbed, if you will, filtered out, only those go through. So when you go to, you know, the 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 sunglasses place and you get polarized uh, prescription sunglasses made, the polarizing glass that's in it is something like this. There's a, you, you can't see them because they're so tiny, the slits, even if you put them on your eye and your, your face and your eyes are close to these polarized pieces of glass, there's very, very tiny little slits and it's only allowing certain amounts of electromagnetic radiation into your eyes and that helps protect your eyes from overexposure and in this case we're using it for a completely different reason so it turns out that once you've passed that light through that filter if you take that plain polarized light and you put behind it a container of a flask a vessel if you will containing one of the two enantiomers, it has to be pure, 100%. Let me take that back. It doesn't have to be 100%, but we'll, let's start with 100%. If you have 100% purity of one of two enantiomers of a substance, and you put it into that vessel, and the light has been filtered through the polarizer, it's suddenly allowed to travel through that sample what's going to happen is that the direction of which that light was oscillating in let's say perfectly vertical to start with because that's the way our filter was oriented it turns out that if you look on the other side it has been rotated by a certain angle it's no longer perfectly vertical it's now either gone a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right well if it rotates to the right, we describe that substance as being dextrorotatory. That is the dextrorotatory enantiomer of that one substance. If you swap out the vessel and you put the other enantiomer, again, let's assume it's 100% pure, right? Let me change colors here. So if I swap this out and put the other one in, what's gonna happen? It's going to rotate by exactly the same number, value, but in the exact opposite direction. 
So that enantiomer we refer to as the levorotatory enantiomer or the L enantiomer. Okay, so this property is called optical rotation. And you may be asking yourself, well, how the hell does that even happen? Well, it turns out because the substances, these molecules are not symmetric. Remember when we started this discussion, asymmetry is what defines chirality. Because they're not symmetric, what that means is that their electron cloud, the surface electrons that make up the molecule, are also distributed in an asymmetrical manner. And therefore, as this electrical field is coming in and interacting with those molecules, because this, the electrons on the surface are in an asymmetric arrangement that causes that light, the electrical field, to shift in one direction. And of course, the enantiomer, it's the exact mirror image. So whatever happened with one, it's going to happen in the opposite direction with the other one, right? So this property we call optical rotation. Every substance that is chiral will have a unique value of angle of rotation or angle of optical rotation. And that number can be used to identify and characterize the compound. So in the pharmaceutical industry, where most of the chiral compounds generated by man are being generated, most drugs are chiral entities, one of the properties that must be measured and recorded with both pure enantiomers is optical rotation. So you have to record the melting point, the boiling point, how much dissolves in water, how much dissolves in acetone, how much dissolves in DMSO or some other organic solvents. And can't forget, you must measure optical rotation. You have to establish whether the compound is dextrorotatory or levorotatory and identify which of the two enantiomers has this property or that property, meaning dextro or levo. Okay? So, let me just tie this together with D versus L sugars. Somebody has a question. The doesn't really run guys, but is this filter paper? Yes, this type of exactly. So certain cameras use these very thin uh, polarizing filter papers. It's exactly the same concept. They they they're they're polarizing. If you look very closely, you can maybe see five very fine little lines in there. Um, of course, if you put them on the microscope, you may see them better, but they're, some, they're super fine. It's not always easy to see, but yes, as far as I know, they're used in, in all kinds of optical things of the sort. All right, so back to sugars. So we've been defining D sugars versus L sugars in terms of structure. Up, down, left, right, whatever it is, right? Well, it turns out that the original definition came from that compound that I started with, with when I started talking about Fisher projections, glyceraldehyde, of which there's only a pair of enantiomers because it has only one chirality center. So it turns out that D-glyceraldehyde happens to be dextrorotatory. And that's how that was originally defined. So that compound served as the reference. That one was, when you put it into the instrument and you measure the optical rotation, D-glyceraldehyde is dextrorotatory. L-glyceraldehyde is levorotatory. It rotates plane polarized light to the left. It turns out that because now we define D versus L in terms of structure, meaning up, down, left, or right, not all D sugars are dextrorotatory in practice. If you put them into the instrument, not all L sugars are levorotatory. Just FYI, it turns out that D-glucose happens to be dextrorotatory. That's why it's also called dextrose, because that D-sugar is dextrorotatory if you measure its optical rotation. It turns out that D-fructose, D-fructose is levorotatory. That's why that compound is commonly also called levulose. Levulose is D-fructose because it's levorotatory. Dextrose is D-glucose because it is dextrorotatory in terms of these types of measurements. So the instrument 
I keep saying the instrument, the instrument. The instrument that is used to make these measurements is called a polarimeter, okay? So typically you have a lamp source and then you have, so this is just illustrating how the light is going everywhere, right? Then you have your polarizing filter and that only allows one particular vertical rotation of light to pass through. Here's your sample. As you notice in the sample, the, the, the vertical rotation is sort of getting moved a little bit. So it comes out distorted, rotated, i.e. optical rotation. And then in order for you as the observer, <coughs> excuse me, on the opposite side, to be able to see the light with its full intensity, you need a second polarizing filter and you have to physically manually rotate it left or right until you see the light at its maximum intensity. When is that gonna be the case? Well, when you've perfectly aligned the slits on your end with how it came out of the sample, that's when you see it at its highest intensity. That's when you can then make the measurement. Oh, I had to rotate this to the left at this many angles or to the right that many angles or degrees, excuse me, to be able to see it at its maximum intensity. And that's how you then record, oh, this is this compound's optical rotation. It's 16 degrees to the right, 18 degrees to the left, whatever it is, right? So if, does the eye use this technique to flip images? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I know that any anything that enters your eye is technically going in the back of your eye, inverted and upside down, and that's how the, um, no, not really. I mean, this is just to simply observe, simply quantify how much you had to rotate the filter to see the light. You're just looking at a light. There's no image. It's just a light. You're just looking at the intensity of the light. Okay. All right. If I go back, let me see how many slides I have to go back. If you notice, here's glucose. Notice it's dextro rotatory by 98 degrees. Here's galactose. It also happens to be dextrorotatory, a little bit different. Here's mannose, plus 14. So each compound is different, right? And just because these are all D sugars, as I said, doesn't mean that they're all going to be necessarily dextrorotatory. You cannot make that assumption. In this case, they happen to be, right? They happen to be. But as I said, D fructose happens to be in the negatives. So there's no correlation whatsoever between D structural assignment up, down, left, or right, and whether it's actually going to rotate left or right. The only one where you can 100% certainty say that is glyceraldehyde. D-glyceraldehyde, 100% certainty is dextrorotatory, and the L version is levorotatory. And what's the optical rotation of L-glucose? Well, it's going to be negative 98 because it's going to be exactly the opposite sign, exactly the same value. Okay? All right. So this is uh, called, the, the technique is called polarimetry, right? And it's where well, you have to go make that measurement and establish whether something is dextro or levorotatory, right? But I've already talked about this. This is where the whole thing about L versus D glyceraldehyde. But for other compounds, there's not necessarily a correlation between the D versus L structural assignment, left, right, up, down, and its actual optical rotation, okay? This is what I said already, right? Glucose is dextrose because it happens, to, it's not because it's D-glucose, it's because it is dextrorotatory. And D-fructose is called levulose, remember levo, right, is left, because it turns out that it is levorotatory. It's just, it happens to be that way. So another important point, what happens if you have a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers? We call that a, uh, a racemic mixture, also known as a racemate. And because each individual isomer rotates in one direction and the other one rotates in the opposite direction with the same magnitude, when you have identical amounts of both, what happens? They cancel each other out. So the sample will have zero optical rotation. It will appear as if there's nothing chiral in the sample. So when you have a sample that has zero optical rotation, it can be two things. It's either a chiral to begin with. Achiral substances do not exhibit optical rotation. It's only an artifact of 
asymmetry, which is what leads to chirality, or if you happen to have equal amounts of the two enantiomers in the same pot, and you sample it and put it in the polarimeter, you're not going to get any rotation because one rotates one way, the other one rotates the other, and they end up each other's effects. Now, of course, when the mixture is not 50-50, we're not going to get too much into that, but this is critically important in the pharmaceutical industry. Depending on what the value actually is, so let's say we just said glucose was nine plus 98, D-glucose. Well, if your sample reads 0.3 and you know there's glucose in there, well, what does that mean? It means that there's some contamination with the other enantiomer. That's what brings the value below the plus 98. If it's still positive 83, then you know that the positive one still predominates. There's more of it, but there's a reasonable amount of the other one contaminating your sample. The closest you get to the known and measured value of the pure enantiomer, so let's say you measure 97, 97 and a half, 97.8, that's as close as you're going to get to 98. That is a very pure sample. But if you're at 92, 91, 93, nope, not there yet, right? And as we're going to discuss, in some cases, you cannot tolerate any contamination with the alternative isomer because that can lead to death, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. So this is this discussion. I think we're going to finish right on time. We're going to wrap up this before we leave today. So as I've been saying, and I started with the example of if you close your eyes and you put your hand in a bag that has left, right, left sided and right sided gloves and you put your right hand into the, into the bag, you're going to know right away when your right hand has entered a right sided glove versus a left sided glove because the perception is different. So all of your biological receptors are chiral for the most part, pretty much every one of them, because they're biological structures. So including your olfactory receptors, we're going to start with that example. So these, these compounds shown here, carvone, there's a single chirality center shown here, because there's only one chirality center, all you have is two compounds, the pair of enantiomers. If I were to pass around two bottles, right? imagine closing your eyes and passing around two bottles, and you smell the plus carvone, which the plus means that it's dextrorotatory. That one smells like caraway seeds. If I then take away that bottle and I start passing around the levorotatory carvone, it will smell like spearmint. For real. This is, this is true, right? We actually have samples of these things in the lab. Of course, we can't go there now, but we have them. It's because these two substances that are asymmetric are entering your nostrils. They're interacting with asymmetric, i.e. chiral receptors. It's like a left and a right hand interacting with only one kind of glove, let's say the left-handed glove, right? So when the levo interacts with the left, it gives you one response that smells like spearmint. When the dextro compound interacts with the left-handed receptor, then it's a different fit. So it gives you a different signal. Your brain interprets that signal differently. That's why it smells now like caraway seeds and not like spearmint. Okay. So these are critically important concepts in terms of uh, foodstuffs, toxins, and pharmaceuticals. Not so much foodstuffs, but toxins and pharmaceuticals. So the enantiomers of a drug can display unique and distinct biological effects. In some cases, one enantiomer does nothing. This is, in fact, what happens with commercial ibuprofen. If you go to, to the pharmacy, if you have to go out only, right, and you have to go buy ibuprofen, well, guess what? You're getting a racemic mixture, 50% dextro, 50% levo, because it turns out that the levo rotatory compound doesn't do anything. It just sits there. The body will take it and metabolize it and get rid of it and nothing. It's the, the dextro compound. 
that actually exerts the anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, anti-analgesic, and all that stuff, the analgesic effects. So it's not an issue to give the drug as a racemic mixture. Well, if you look at the bottom of this slide, here's another pair of enantiomers. There's a single Corelli center here as well, here, and I'm highlighting it in blue. Plus and minus timolol. It turns out in this case, they both have effects, but they're different. They're both useful and they're different. So in this case, we isolate the two compounds and we market them differently. The levorotatory is used for angina and hypertension, the, the dextrorotatory is used for glaucoma, two completely different responses. If you look at the uh, other classes of drugs that are out there, in some cases, what happens is that one enantiomer is toxic, toxic and deadly. And of course, that one has to be 100% or as close as 100% removed as you can, right? Here, for example, penicillamine, the positive meaning dextrorotary compound is useful for arthritis. The other compound has one chorality center as well, toxic, must be 100% removed because otherwise you can't put the drug out on the market, right? Here's another example, naproxen, very common. You can buy over-the-counter naproxen as a, as a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's the dextrorotatory compound that causes the desired effects. Guess what? If your compound were to be contaminated with the alternative, then it would be a toxic compound. So when a new drug is produced and prepared, both enantiomers together as a racemic mixture plus each enantiomer on their own must be tested to observe if there's any type of ill effects associated with either the mixture or each compound on its own. The Any minimum inclination or indication that there's problems with the presence of one enantiomer and the presence of the other or with one or the other independently, then they absolutely must be separated in order to be able to do anything with that compound. And that process of separating enantiomers is referred to as resolution, okay? So again, to, to establish the degree of contamination, you'd have to measure you, the optical rotation of the compound, and you want to get as close as you can within a very small percent. There's thresholds of allowance of how much of the contamination can be. Typically, again, back to glucose, glucose is 98. You can't tolerate anything less than 97 and a half, let's say, right? Because anything less than that, glucose is not toxic in either way. But in the case of penicillamine, you cannot have anything less than a smidgen of a contamination, okay? So where does the, what, what we'll end with, I think we have probably one or two more slides and then we're done for two. We have about three minutes. Where did this come from? How did this all come about? Well, there's a, there's a tragic story that you may have read about at some point in your life about thalidomide. So thalidomide is shown here on the top of the slide. It also has a single chorality center. Thalidomide in the 1950s was marketed as the wonder drug to treat morning sickness in pregnant women. And then it turns out that nine months later is when we come to find out that these drugs, the drug, which was marketed as a racemic mixture, uh, was causing all kinds of problems with development of the fetus. It, it's what we call a teratogen. It's a substance that causes malformations as the uh, embryo and ultimately the fetus is developing. What kinds of malformations? Things that you don't even want to know about, but deformed eyes, hearts, deformed, I mean, all kinds of horrendous deformities. Many babies, unfortunately, were born, did not survive. Others that did survive didn't live for long, and some did live into higher ages, all kinds of deformities, all kinds of problems. Ultimately, it was traced back to the levorotatory thalidomide in the mixture. So this is why, as I've said already, any new drug that is chiral, which is pretty much every drug that's out there, we need to test. And sadly, this is primarily in animals. This is another tragedy. But anyway, test the racemic mixture and separate the enantiomers and test them independently. If there's any indication that there's any issues with any of them on their own or the mixture, then they 
automatically must be separated and that's the only way that that drug can be marketed okay so because we're running out of time we only have like two slides i'll just briefly introduce the concept of resolution again it's the process of separating these stereoisomers it's actually very expensive so it's not necessarily the levorotatory somebody's asking if it's the levo that causes the problem no it depends on the drug it really depends on the specific drug and they need to be tested to ensure if there's any issues. If there's no issues, they can be marketed as a racemic mixture. But if there's any issues, whether either in the racemic mixture or any of them individually, then they have to be separated completely. And then the one that actually gives you the desired effect must be marketed as the sole enantiomer. The other one must not be anywhere near the, the formulations. So this is resolution. We'll start with that on, um, on Thursday, because today's Tuesday. All right, so that's the end for today, guys. We're gonna continue on Thursday after uh, Thursday morning everybody have a great day